Okay, Unit 4 is uh, titled A Divided Nation, and we're going to cover standards 8, 9, and 10. Let's, uh, let's look at that and compare that to the ones we've already gone over. Unit 1 was called the Colonial Era, Standard 1, Standard 2, and Standard 3. Unit 2 was Standard 4 and 5, Revolution to the Constitution. Unit 3 was Standard 6 and Standard 7, Creating a New Nation. And now we're on Unit 4. Standard 8, Standard 9, and Standard 10, a divided nation. Uh, in Standard 8, we're going to talk about events leading to the Civil War. Uh, Standard 9, we're going to talk about just a few, few events leading to it in the beginning, then the election of Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War itself, the battles and the leaders. And then in Standard 9, we're going to talk about Reconstruction. So we're going to talk about the Civil War and Reconstruction in this divided nation in Unit 4. Uh, let's start with Standard 8. Okay. Uh, we have A, B, C, D, E. We have five substandards. And we, have, we have to tie all these in with this up here uh, to look at what, what are the North-South divisions or what sectionalism, what events caused our country to rip apart pretty much. All right, so the classroom is about language of the standards. It's about focusing on these standards, so that's what we're doing. Let's look at standard eight. Uh, the, the overall focus would be uh, you as a student will be able to explain the relationship between growing north-south divisions. Another way of saying north-south divisions could be north-south tensions or could be sectionalism is another word we're going to talk about and westward expansion. So we need to talk about north-south divisions or tensions or sectionalism and then we need to talk about westward expansion and then we need to tie these two together and look at the relationship between them. So that's what we're going to do in eight. All right, so uh, let's see. This growing north-south divisions, when we talk about it, I want to stress and emphasize, you know, really and truly is equivalent to saying this word sectionalism. We've already talked about sectionalism. We talked about in the last unit how Eli Whitney created the cotton gin and interchangeable parts and how it, it kind of functioned to or, or, or kind of magnified the differences that already existed in the United States and then led us from nationalism to sectionalism. And here we're on the same topic again. Sectionalism, uh, Eli Whitney contributed to this, the economic splitting of the United States into two sections of the country because of his inventions. So we talk about economic, economic sectionalism. What's the difference between the nationalism we experienced after the War of 1812, uh, you know, with at the end of the uh, Jacksonian democracy, this uh, these factors that strengthen or unify the United States and made it secure, increased its size and made it powerful, that's nationalism. Sectionalism goes in the opposite direction is when people, uh, this is the practice of placing one's own region ahead of the interest of the nation as a whole. So if people in the South put their interest ahead of the nation as a whole, the United States, Southern states think they're more important than the United States as one nation. Uh, and northern people are going to make arguments and, and put their interest in the north ahead of the nation as a whole. And eventually we're going to have a sectional country. We're going to have these north-south tensions or events, a uh, series of events that are going to be, uh, cause a lot of trouble and eventually going to rip our country apart and make us have a civil war. So nationalism to sectionalism, this change is... Um, uh, feelings between the North and South are going to change. Uh, the United States are going to become more sectional because of major differences between the North and the South, between their ways of life, meaning social social sectionalism, or social differences, uh, the economy, economic differences, or economic uh, sectionalism, and uh, cultural uh, and political differences are going to be uh, closely aligned with all these social, economic, and cultural differences. If we look at some economic differences we've already discussed 
and how they contribute to sectionalism, we see the differences. The North, uh, we said, was based on manufacturing and industry. Uh, it's going to support these things we call tariffs, and tariffs are tax on imported goods. We're going to look at those closer. There's going to be a conflict there about tariffs in 1828 and 1832. The North, as we said, is going to grow to oppose the spread of slavery West. And during the Industrial Revolution, we talked about how mechanized labor began to be used instead of, you know, uh, slavery. And in the South, we see that it's based on agriculture. This economy is based on agriculture. And we know that the institution of slavery uh, rose there in African-American culture is going to sprout up there. And African-American population is going to spread across there. Uh, we talked about that already. And it's based on the institution of slavery using this human labor source. And they're going to oppose these tariffs or tax on imported goods. And they're going to support the spread of slavery westward. So these differences are going to create this, these feelings of sectionalism. Uh, North Northerners uh, opposing the Southerners and Southerners opposing the Northerners. So we see differences that the North is, economy is based on manufacturing. South is on agriculture. You know, North uses free labor. South uses slave labor. You know, the North opposed slavery. South pr wants to protect slavery. And then the North wants to stop the spread of slavery. The South wants to spread slavery and ensure that it goes westward as we move westward, manifest destiny. And uh, these differences are going to cause this sectionalism or these North-South tensions that are going to rip our country apart and cause a civil war. So that's what we're talking about here. And here's a picture of the growth of cotton in the South and how that spreads out and why slave labor was so important to them. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, we just looked at, uh, you know, these north-south divisions that are coming. And let's talk about westward expansion real quick. The country is going to experience some territorial growth with these new acquisitions of territory that we talked about in Unit 3 and this sectionalism together are going to be coupled and, and that's what we're talking about this relationship here manifest destiny with this was this idea that God wanted us to own all land from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Pacific Ocean the entire continent that God was on our side he wanted us to own that um, and that is manifest destiny in middle school you might have heard from sea to shine and sea or something like that you know but here uh, is a representation. I think we talked about this picture in the last unit. We talked about manifest destiny. But uh, our movement west, we believe, was ordained by God. So in territorial growth, this territorial expansion that we're going to see here in the United States from the, uh, from the t annexation of Texas and Mets concession, the gas and purchase we talked about in Oregon, you know, that territorial growth is synonymous with manifest destiny. You know, we could say that these are similar in respects. When I think about manifest destiny, I think about territorial growth and this idea that God wanted us to have all this land. And that's what the term means. So, this relationship between these north south divisions and this idea of westward expansion coupled together are going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, one of the biggest questions that's going to be very divisive is will slavery spread westward? You know, when we move past here into this area, we already, you know, some of that has already been asked, answered in the north, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But as we move westward as a country and as people populate these areas and they become states, you know, will slavery be allowed to spread out that way? That's the biggest question. The North says no, the South says yes. Big arguments, big sectional tensions or North-South divisions. Nat Turner uh, is one of the people we're supposed to talk about uh, in, in A, uh, 8A, explain how slavery became a significant issue in American politics. So we want to talk about that. And then it says include the slave rebellion of Nat Turner and the rise of abolitionism, William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and the Grimke sisters. Let's turn our attention to how slavery became a significant issue in American politics, and then we'll turn our attention to Nat Turner and how he's going to stir things up. Okay. 
And let's look at this element sheet. Abolitionist movement or abolitionism uh, is going to be political and social interactions is a thing. And abolition or beliefs and ideas as well you could put in there. Nat Turner is about slavery and conflict. Uh, North-South tensions, so you could put abolition over here too uh, with Nat Turner. North-South tensions, sectionalism and conflict between the North and South. William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass and the Grimke sisters. All ideas and beliefs about reform, all of these will be uh, abolitionist. Okay. So let's talk about how did slavery become a significant issue in American politics. You know, we can go far back on that. We can talk about the settlement of the of these colonies when they originally, when the colonists originally came. You know, some people would argue that you know the South was more interested in making a profit and was more willing to adopt human bondage. Now, the North come for religious reasons and eventually we're going to see that they're going to say that human bondage and slavery is a sin. And God doesn't like it; it's ugly. Although there were some slaves in the North, so you know we have to take this in consideration. This is a good argument. This could say, you know, this is why it's going to become eventually. And, you know, I, I think of it as a development of the United States. Over time, is how slavery becomes an issue. Geographic determinism uh, would be another argument that, that the geography of the United States determines how these regions are going to be developed. And, and with the South being more agricultural and having this labor-intensive job, that slavery was going to adopt itself there. And then the North is being more industrial and having more iron ore in the ground would become more uh, in, uh, manufacturing-centered, uh, using mechanized labor. And we talked about these differences and tobacco being in the south and being a crop that needed a lot of labor um, and it was intensive and then in New England we talked about you know these religious reasons for selling but we talked about you know the geography of the land and the economy based on uh, trade and commerce fishing shipbuilding things that didn't require agricultural labor to a large degree plantation agriculture in the south and this commercialized industry in the north so the ec economic determinism and then we turn to the great awakening the first one you know we talked about this social rebellion that happened in the puritans and we talked about you know the spiritual belief in democratic concepts like egalitarian rules equality and freedom some more democratic ideas sprout out because of this great awakening. All right, and then we talked about the Northwest Territory. Slavery was not allowed in the Northwest Tory Territory because the original founding fathers, like Thomas Jefferson, believed that slavery should not spread westward. They viewed slavery as a necessary evil when we first started establishing our country on the eastern seaboard but when we moved out west they thought we should have this gradual emancipation of slaves over time uh, and with this northwest territory outlaw and slavery over time we talked about before that it, when the when the northeast you know kind of uh, abolishes slavery or comes to this abolitionist movement that it's going to create this northern region of the country above the mason dixon line that became opposed to slavery because they didn't need it anymore and because on religious grounds they thought it was wrong an abomination to God all right so our essential question uh, if we get back to our topic is what events or north-south tensions caused the United States to sectionalize and have a civil war uh, these events are numerous there's a lot of them and you know it's kind of confusing when we go through this uh, these north-south tensions these events that cause this and cause the United States to become sexualized but we need to look at this image here uh, here they are there's a lot of them and you know I'm gonna be quite honest with you here each one of these is a potential you know EOCT question for US history the Nat Turner revolt abolitionist movement Missouri compromise nullification crisis the Wilmot proviso Compromise of 1850, Kansas-Nebraska Act, Dred Scott decision, John Brown's raid, election of 1860, and 
and, and, and all these are going to be these divisive issues that are north-south tensions that's going to push us toward this civil war and rip our country apart under sectionalism. In this standard eight, we're going to talk about Nat Turner, the abolitionist, uh, Missouri Compromise, Nullification Crisis, Wilmot Proviso, Compromise of 1850. And then in Standard 9, we'll talk about the rest of these. So we're going to go from Nat Turner to the Compromise of 1850. In this video, we're going to cover Nat Turner, the abolitionist. And then the next one we'll pick up. All right, and we'll return back to this. So some religious differences. We're talking about Nat Turner now. And uh, Nat Turner is really the focus we're looking here in this standard, uh, standard 8A. And we, it says explain uh, how slavery did that. Include, there's include the slave rebellion of Nat Turner and the rise of abolitionism. And it says William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and, and the Grimke sisters. So we're going to look at Nat Turner and this rise of this abolitionist movement and look at these three individuals. That's what we want to do. Uh, so we're going to talk about Nat Turner and the abolitionists. So what caused Nat Turner to rebel? Uh, very simply, is the Second Great Awakening. You know, we talked about the first, and I don't want to confuse you here, but the Second Great Awakening happened from 1790 to about 1840. It's similar to the First Great Awakening that it was a religious revival. And that a lot of evangelism, a lot of preachers going around from place to place, you know, with this emotional, heartfelt appeal to religion, religion of the heart that we talked about, and they were trying to convert people to change their sinful ways and turn to God. All right, in the Second Great Awakening, they encouraged uh, participating in social causes to change American life. In other words, the social cause would be abolition. In other words, slavery. Slavery's ugly, God hates it, let's get rid of it, and let's participate and become active in getting rid of it. Participants understood that reform was a part of God's plan. In other words, God called them to change things, to reform things. And these individuals are going to dedicate their lives themselves to purifying the world. And in this case, Nat Turner is going to become a part of this and, and want to end slavery. So here's Nat Turner. He was a minister, a preacher. So he was in the faith. He was reading the Bible and uh, understanding it. And he was talking to his people, uh, Af other African Americans, and preaching to them. And uh, he preached that slavery is morally wrong. God didn't like it. And he's going to lead slaves and arm them with weapons, uh, plowshares, whatever, swords. And they're gonna, he's going to lead them in a rebellion and try to get their freedom in Southampton County, Virginia in 1831. Southampton County, Virginia. He's going to kill 55 to 65 white people. That is uh, Nat Turner's rebellion. Here's a portrait of Nat Turner in the woods preaching to some of uh, the other slaves about, you know, his plan. And they went about killing, uh, you know, women and men, their masters, but also women and children too. You know, they killed a lot of children. And uh, 55 to 60 people, I don't know how many of those were children, but a lot of violent stuff happened during this, okay? Now, uh, a lawyer around this area, around Richmond, Virginia, I believe, around Southampton County, Virginia, his name was Thomas H. Gray, went and met with, uh, with Nat Turner after he was caught and was waiting trial, and he interviewed him, and uh, he wrote a pamphlet or book called The Confessions of Nat Turner, the leader of the Nat Turner Rebellion. And in this book, he reveals that Nat Turner uh, confessed that God had delivered him to lead his people out of slavery. And he considered himself the Black Moses. So his job, according to God, was to leave his people, lead his people out of slavery. And that was a connection to Moses and the leading of the Israelites out of Egypt. There's a lot of preaching in the Bible about that. And then he admitted to what he did... Uh, uh, was ordained by God and justified. And in this book, Nat Turner's Confession, uh, this is in the first part of it. This is a quote from Nat Turner. I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the Spirit instantly appeared to me and said that the serpent was loosened 
and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent, meaning the devil. For the time was fast approaching when the first should be last, and the last should be first. So Nat Turner was definitely an abolitionist along with uh, these other three people we're going to talk about. And he wants to end slavery, so we can consider him an abolitionist, although he is a violent abolitionist. He kills 55 to 60 people, including women and children. So that was his intentions, was to end slavery, and he's wrapped up in the Second Great Awakening and spurred by this religious beliefs. Uh, in the response to Nat Turner's rebellion, Southerners, uh, 200 white, 200 people, uh, 200 slaves are going to be rounded up and killed by these white mobs and vigilante groups, small militias, and uh, Turner is going to be held for trial and hanged from a tree, right outside the courtroom, and then laws are going to be passed keeping blacks from worshiping in churches and so, and preaching to one another without white masters being present. So things uh, become stricter in the South. The rules. Uh, but uh, the overall national consequence was in the media and the newspapers. People were talking about the Turner revolt. And Southerners and Northerners uh, looked at the event differently. Northerners, a bunch of abolitionists, are people that is gonna, are going to be uh, strengthen their abolitionist cause, were alarmed and ignited by the desire of Nat Turner to free the slaves on moral and religious grounds. So they're going to push their abolitionist movement a little bit further and become more impassioned by it. And they see Nat Turner as a hero of the cause. Southerners are going to be horrified at the idea of an all-out slave revolt killing all the white people in the South. And they were th their, their lives were threatened, but also their economic fortunes. Their economy was based on uh, Southern slavery. So this Nat Turner issue is going to contribute to these north-south tensions that's going to rip the country apart. This factionalist ideas and spirit, this opposing one another uh, on set regional grounds, north versus the south. There's going to be arguments over the morality of the ownerships of slaves and then sectionalism over the slavery issue. Uh, so we're going to see that the North argues that slavery is morally wrong, should be abolished, and Nat Turner is a hero. Southerners are going to turn the idea about having slaves. The first generation said it was a necessary evil. These new Southerners, once they're under attack, are going to turn to racial stereotypes and the, and, and the strengthening of uh, what we call racism. And that they argue that slaves were ignorant and violent and childlike and can't take care of themselves and southerners would take care of them in a patriarchal manner because it was their moral obligation to do so God wanted them to take care of these children and uh, Nat Turner should be hanged for his insurrection that's how southerners felt about it all right so our standard 8a says uh, include the slave rebellion of Nat Turner and the rise of the abolitionist movement or of abolitionism William Lloyd Garrison Frederick Douglass and Grimke sisters alright so we've covered Nat Turner now we're on the abolitionist uh, as events leading to the Civil War rise of abolitionism let's talk about the meaning of abolitionism the definition of, of uh, an abolitionist is a person who wishes to put an end to or eliminate slavery immediately. An abolitionist movement is an organized effort by a group of people to end slavery. What are the characteristics are stop, stop slavery, put an end to slavery, do away with slavery, eliminate slavery, get rid of slavery. You know, any type of words you want to use, slavery must end. An example of abolitionist is William Lloyd Garrison, a white abolitionist leader and publisher of the Liberator and then another example is Frederick Douglass a former slave and publisher of the North Star these are examples of abolitionists non examples would basically be masters on the plantations who own slaves you know their objective is to enslave to bind to yoke to shackle uh, forever and ever so they're not interested in abolitionism alright so Frederick Douglass here was a former urban a, a former slave who escaped up north uh, in under, underground railroad 
and uh, he uses the North Star to find his way north northward. He becomes a famous abolitionist and a spokesperson and advocate for the abolitionist movement. And he becomes uh, uh, he owns this newspaper that's dedicated to abolition abolition movement or abolitionism. Uh, and his newspaper is called the North Star. He titles it the North Star. And the good way to remember that is. You know, he stole himself out of slavery, and he uses North Star to go northward as a map to head north on the Underground Railroad. William Roy Garrison was a white abolitionist. Uh, he's the publisher of a newspaper that he called The Liberator. And to liberate means to free. Uh, and that's what the purpose of his newspaper was, as abolitionist against slavery and for the immediate ending of slavery in the United States. And then two other abolitionists are the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina. We talked about these women were also involved in the women's suffrage movement. A lot of the a lot of women are involved in this abolitionist movement. Their parents owned slaves that grew up on a slave plantation, uh, yet they become abolitionists and powerful spokespersons for the anti-slavery or abolitionist movement. So what we're going to get from this is that Nat Turner was an abolitionist, yet he was a uh, a violent one. These three are not violent, yet Nat Turner was. Now if we look at comparison and contrast and look how they're similar, Nat Turner is an African American slave minister. Uh, Frederick Douglass is an African American who stole himself out of slavery. So there's a difference here, but they're both African American men who were abolitionists. If we look at William Lloyd Garrison and Grimke sisters, they're both white. All three of those are white, excuse me. William Lloyd Garrison was a white man opposed to slavery and abolitionists. The Grimke sisters were women who were abolitionists who opposed slavery, and they grew up on southern plantations. So similarities and differences or compare and contrast are very important to understand. All right. So have we met our objective? Have we have we covered 8A is our question. So have we explained slavery, how it became a significant issue in American politics? And have we talked about the slave rebellion of Nat Turner and the rise of abolitionism? William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and Grimke sisters. I think we have. Uh, good luck on the test.